cold in some places, freezing in some places, warm, warm and easy in places, tropics, Arctic, Antarctic, Southwest, Northeast, wherever you are is where you are and you're bringing a lot of good Dhamma energy. Through each of these windows and out of your house or apartment into the community and the country, wherever you are. Remember how much just a moment of metta or moment of mindful awareness has such a significant, unimaginable effect on all sentient beings in our planet. Oh, nice to see you all. I have to look extra hard like Michelle always does because she looks right into every part of your house and your psyche and knows everything. <laughs> so I have to try a little harder. We have a cat's tail in the sitting this morning. Darine, are you ready to lead us into meditation? I am ready. I'm also enjoying everybody's presence. <laughs> it's lovely to be here with you. And um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, Very well. great. Great. No. Super sweet. It's just our bells we couldn't hear. Yes, that's right. Without, without Jesse, I don't know how to correct that. It's just it's a loud bell. I can't believe anyone can't hear it. No? No. Australia is there. Hi, Ian. So let's um, go ahead and if it's comfortable for you, let your eyes close. And let awareness gently and slowly land inside your body wherever it is that it's awareness landing naturally for you And whether it's in the contact with the seat bones and the chair, the cushion, or the movement of the breath. Body sensations. Sound. See if you can settle back and allow whatever the experience is in the forms of textures, vibrations, temperature. See if you can just receive them.
like listening. There is no need to lean forward and search or dig for any experience. Trusting that whatever is arising and obvious, predominant, is exactly what it's supposed to be known directly, not through the thought process, even though we'll have an image or words to describe the experience. We just notice that and relax deeper into this receiving quality. And we might notice that some experiences are pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. They come and go by themselves. And we observe and know and feel directly this stream of nature arising, persisting, and disappearing all by themselves. And also it's important sometimes and helpful to notice the quality of awareness as is relating to experience or connecting with experience. And check if it's, there is a quality of gentleness. Softness. friendliness, acceptance. Okayness. And we can stay with the primary anchor of our attention for as long as it feels available, natural, helpful as a place of rest or stability. We can open up our attention and move through this five, Sense doors, tasting, smelling, the mind door, any kind of emotion, full range, joy, loneliness, resentment. compassion, whatever it is, if knowing that this is not mine or me, sometimes there is an office space and there is not a sense of identification. It's 
just sadness. Just excitement. Check the correspondence physical sensations in the body. Is it tight or tingly? Relax, expand, expanded energy. Bring in some interest in this human experience moment by moment as it change. We try our best to relate with care. Or appreciation. or a sense of discovery, because we know that every moment is new, is fresh.
Thank you for your practice. Steve? Oh, we cannot hear you. Really? Now we can. Okay. <laughs> if I push any button, it just says mute. So <laughs> I better not push it. If you have any uh, practice questions. This is the time. Or you can report on how you experience something through one of the sense doors. Like here in the morning, there's so many kinds of birds out in the poinciana tree or the rain tree, these hundred year old trees. And the sun's just coming up. And it's like their morning calls. It's just sound vibration in its direct purity. But of course, images come up and reflections and wonder. And just the attunement to all of that sound vibration mental pictures, wondering, appreciation, the beauty. It's, it's, it's dark at first when we start. And now just the sun is coming through the trees. So sound for me is a nice early morning meditation, attunement. In addition to feeling the body move from sleep mode to waking, a tendency to lean back towards slumber and come back toward waking. It's an interesting play and our job is to frame the significance, the importance, the value of sati, that pre-verbal mindfulness that's just present for anything. It's there, it has no agenda, doesn't want anything, doesn't need to get rid of anything, no manipulation or effort to control just the perfect mirroring of what is there, which is the setup for, for wisdom to arise, for insight, to see clearly the characteristics, the changeability, the ephemeralness, the uncontrollability, the emptiness of self. You don't have to look for that. Just 
we hear it often enough in a moment's reflection reminds us that don't have, we don't have to do anything. The whole universe is expressing itself moment to moment through the five physical senses and the heart mind door. Let's just inviting that prominent tool of insight progression and wisdom liberation called mindfulness to come forward and e even study carefully mindfulness, turn mindfulness on itself to realize that it's not controlling or trying or manipulating or expecting, wanting or not wanting. So in itself, it's just the ultimate rest to abide mindfully. And mindfulness works when four things arise. Kaya nupasana is bodily, seen clearly, Vedana Upasana is feeling tone, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, arising naturally every moment, whether we see it or don't see it, expect it or not expect it, it's there through any of the sense doors. Chitta Upasana is uh, mindfulness of consciousness all its permeations of thought formations, imagery, recollection, projection, imagination, fantasy. And as those contents settle down, the very subtle stream of conscious moments itself, just streaming along. And there can't be consciousness without something to be conscious of. So at the very least, consciousness is aware of itself in that stream. But if we look, it might be aware of the general, general surround of sensations, visual experience, sound, vibrations, various senses, other expressions of the mental portal of experience, imagination, fantasy, recollection. Some of our recollections are wise recollection Wise consideration is what's happening now, appropriate, useful, attuned to reality, to felt sense experience, things that we can say are real, are true. So all these doorways, portals open up, vast honeycomb-like hallways of discovery, unique to each of us as human beings in the way our senses play out due to our preferences, our inclinations, past habits in this life or previous lives, what we're good at, such as the detailed way in which we might 
see color and form, light and shadow, details of the visuous, visual field. In that way, we're all artists. Or we might attune to the various forms and subtleties of sound vibration. It, it just doesn't take long until that's it. There's really nothing else. That's who we are. Sensation, sound vibrations, visual experience, thought formations, uh, fragrance, experience, taste, touch, tactile sensations. That's our world and it's so vast. When we exercise one of the Brahma Viharas, for example, there's no limitation. The sense doors participate, they open up and off, often contribute or accompany the expansion, the boundlessness, the measurelessness of loving kindness and the deep, profound, penetrating care of compassion that also knows no end to our ability to feel in, symp in symmetry and sympathy our own and others' pain. Likewise with joy And of course, the equanimity as relationship to other beings and possessions, as well as its similarity and crossover to Vipassana equanimity. Same changes of consciousness and qualities of mental clarity and stillness in both the Vipassana and Brahma Vihara, Upeka, equanimity. Just to appreciate that every one of you knows this practice thoroughly, regardless of whether we think so or not. And we use our wisdom every day, just automatically knowing what's the skillful or unskillful way to think about something, speak about something, do things. Whether we act on that or not, we know it. We're trained to attune to what is not harmful, not hurtful, but unifying and helpful and building a world inside and outside. And the moments of appreciating that like our practice of murita makes us happy to understand. When we understand something, we love it. Whether it's a person or a place, deep understanding, non-intellectual, intuitive understanding and love come together, metta and Anya, wisdom. So you, you're all just so far more remarkable than you might think you are. 
<laughs> and we enjoy seeing it. It sits in you. You sit here every Sunday and probably many times during the week. And of course, doing retreats. It's such a joy and it's such a um, reciprocity. We feel grateful and we feel inspired and we feel affirmed by your presence and your practice. It certainly doesn't need to be perfect. All of our experience is impermanent, imperfect, impersonal. That's the truth of it. That's what gets us liberated. So maybe questions or comments on that little rift, the morning rift of the sun now is in my eyes. <laughs> Oh, there's a hand, Catalina. Good morning, or afternoon, or evening. evening. Where are you? Evening here, and frozen evening here. <laughs> On the eastern coast? East, right, yeah. Yes. My driveway is a block of ice. My stairs oh, no. are block of ice. It's like, ah, anyway. <laughs> I fear that more than anything. Oof. When Michelle and I would teach in Massachusetts in the winter, yeah. slipping on ice or driving on ice, oh. banging my head or my back on ice because you just, you don't know it. It looks so solid and then zoom. Yes. You're just down. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just scary. <laughs> I love water, but I love the, I love the soft water. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so i my, hope you're being careful yeah 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 i, I walk very very slow good <laughs> so i have a question um is regarding equanimity and death <clears throat> i have been like a, I, I i talked spoke before I, when my nephew died um, um and then i have had a lot of death like a in my family, in my friends, with my pets, and 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 I like a oh, one. Oh, oh, Jesus is awful! Like a, a yeah. March was my one my cat. Then October was my nephew. Then um, another um, my dog was in December. It's like a, it's one after the other. And now one of my cats is dying too. And now today I know that one of my friends is dying too. It's like oh my. God is is it's um it's kind of overwhelming. Yes, of course. You know, like a, I had been able to take some of the death with a lot of equanimity. I am so surprised about that. But mm. um, all like like my nephew one was like so 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 shocking that I you know I, I it was for me so awful that I couldn't recuperate for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, but today. Naturally. I, I heard about my friend also dying and and uh, so I feel like I I am supposed to be equanimous acceptance of the impermanence and and the nature of life that that's it um, but still it's like a, a, it's like when 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 can I have a break about that when I can 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 you know be stop this 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 so much pain coming from from seeing um seeing the end of life so if you can talk a little bit about that i will appreciate sure and catalina it's not that we're supposed to see and understand a nietzsche nature impermanence or dukkha the fragility and unknown 
unsatisfactoriness of life, or the anatta that we can't control things, we can't keep people and things that we love alive, we can't prevent them from passing. It, just those are results eventually and gradually of our practice. It's the same three insights that we, we have again and again over the years that the Buddha struggled for many years to see. And even after his awakening, the same insights he would have when he would sit, you know, to just calm into and sink into the truth of things, that all things are anicca nature and they change or they pass away because that's the nature of things or they're dukkha because they're unreliable for security and to hold on to, and they're uncontrollable, that, that all the arhants, all the nuns and monks and lay people, the same insights again and again, but each time seen a, a various layer, like, of course, your nephew would be a strong one, and it would, it would vibrate pretty continuously for a while in your heart and in your body. And, you know, and, and to, to understand that and to allow for that, the, the practice I would likely do at, at, in your circumstance is open up to the grief, make a shelter for the grief and the pain and the loss and feel it, you know, just completely face it the way that, that arahants, enlightened women and men, nuns and monks and elephants, when their attention is drawn, they turn their whole body and they, it's a full body attention to what's happening. They give their everything, their whole being, every molecule of their being to what's calling their attention. And that's what we might attempt to do with grief, with loss, with sorrow, with sadness. It's just completely open to it and feel it. If we, if we do, mindfulness is almost certain to be there. And if mindfulness is there for consistent moments, so is the wisdom that sees clearly the nature of grief without identifying with it, without making it I or me or mine. The nature of sorrow is just sorrow, not belonging anywhere. We don't self-reference it. It's just sorrow and grief and loss. And by completely feeling them at those times, our, our system is able to do what those emotions are meant to do, to grieve, to feel loss, to feel sorrow, to go through that process often many times. It, 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 depending, especially on the gravity of the loss, like your nephew, and then the you know, the closeness of all these, you know, your pets and so many things happening so close together, kind of overwhelming. So that often you, you might want to step back and just feel compassion, self-compassion or self-love for yourself or your surround, the environment around you, the envi you know, the birds, the sun, the leaves, the grass just connect to everything around you that is makes makes you makes your physicality almost everything we see and hear contributes to this sixth sense sentient being that we are and you need to respect you need to respect the need to step back and and, and have a rest from the overwhelm and maybe just take little tastes once in a while of the grief or the loss, little reflections, 
like a homeopathic dose and then step back again and have touchstones, safe places that you go to in your body, in your imagination, or in your actual environment. Something you see, you know, across the room. I have a couple, a few Buddha statues and a crystal and exercise equipment and just kind of stare at those things and some art and just, well, there's that too. And, and with that, Buddha face says to me, or what that Japanese empty circle, you know, says to me. And rest there, breathe there, be there. And when you're ready to, you know, uh, again, allow in some of that loss and grief. And in that way, you're kind of opening it up to the earth to help you. It's not all confined and just in your body, in your house, in your space. It's kind of out there everywhere because everything experiences loss, change, grief, sorrow, death. And so you know, to give it that kind of space as well as acknowledge the personal. Back and forth that way. And then, like, invite nature to tell you what's happening without any expectation. Darine, I know you can add to that. I think just to, um... I'm going to repeat what Steve said. Um, if you notice that there is resistance, like let resistance guide you in this uh, micro dosing or um, of feeling the pain and, and know that you can also, or the loss and just keep an eye on resistance as um, uh, your guide, but also uh, to include, to have a relationship with it in this process. That's excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, yeah. Resistance isn't just something in the way, it's often a message to pause. Just to pause for a while, to rest for a while. An important message. It's a protector. Thanks, Catalina, and thank you, Dorine. Hello, Julia. Hello, I want, I, I want, is it, oh, is it? Yeah, you can it's hear okay me. Now. Um, on a very uh, mundane level, I just want to give you um, and Irene a progress report. You remember the problem I was having with hearing when I when we were in uh, our jungle paradise? Yes. Well, thanks to your advice and uh, your persistence, Irene, I now have two very excellent hearing aids. <laughs> <laughs> when you were talking about the the sense star, yes, <laughs> but it's it's changing the the it's. Well, yeah, it's changing the 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 sense door experience for sure, and it's um, uh, uh, it's much sharper, and it's a grating as well. And I have to, I'm you know, I'm I'm, I'm playing with it and seeing um, how uh, I, I much much too easily go into my natural default which is irritability at the sharpness of the sounds but i just want to thank you both because it's it's progress anyway so that's, that's beautiful that's great to hear it is great to hear yes indeed <laughs> i really enjoyed the the hearing technician i went to a few years ago and i i, I just wanted to hear better so i, I didn't have to have 
conversation conversations that were always what what Stephen <laughs> what <laughs> and and I liked him so much that I, I just trusted him and then my first experience was I heard all these sounds I hadn't heard since childhood <laughs> you know in Hawaii it took another two or three years to get Michelle to go to him and she also liked him but she hates to put things around or in her ears. So it took another two years and visits to him to gradually work out where how she could put them in her ears. And, and she too suddenly heard sounds that she hadn't heard, you know, since 1952 or something. <laughs> it does change and all of a sudden we recognize a sense door that's kind of been in the background for a long time. That's really sweet. Yes, it is indeed. <laughs> so thank you both. I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. It's really apt. And uh, a number of us are, are getting to that time when our faculties are, you know, diminishing a bit. So I like to hear, you know, so like I'm outside in nature, mm -hmm. I'll turn them up so I can hear the subtlest little crickets or dragonflies, you know, buzzing around, especially like in the jungle retreat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I should have had them there. That would have been good. <laughs> oh, just amazing yeah. to have them there. Mm, I can uh, imagine. Yeah. Just be careful. It's very deep. If you drop them in the... <laughs> they go down about 100 feet and you're not going to see them again. <laughs> just be really careful and or attach a little string to them with you know with a with a, a fishing float on it okay Steve. <laughs> you're getting very creative with that <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> good advice darine i didn't know you did that what <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you better make an appointment right away. <laughs> right. It, there, there is always something for me is the visual. So I understand. Yeah. I'm very happy for you, Julia. Yay. These are all significant teachings, you know, at, if we're anything over 30 or 40 or 50, especially 60, we're gonna be affected by one sense door or the other. And we either need more care, more silence, more patience, or we need an instrument. Glasses, hearing aids. Sometimes a walking stick. Are you getting ready for a question, Tracy? <laughs> How can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> well, by so, doing this for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so there's a couple, couple of things. One is, um, I'm not sure if you and Dadine have seen that someone was asking, um, saying in the chat they were hoping Michelle was okay so I wanted to make sure you knew that she's okay but she's doing a self-retreat I know that but I, yeah. I just wanted to make sure you knew so you might speak yeah. to it. well um, I, we do she she texts me whenever she sits and if it's a time when I'm awake I sit with her oh yeah that's nice um well I've had this question um 
Maybe I'll say something first. So, you know, I did the one month retreat in January. And so being back in daily life, um, it's, it's formal practice with the mind, um, doing so much thinking. It's just, it's just unpleasant. <laughs> just, and so what do you, mean, what do you mean by so much thinking? Tracy. Well, just just noticing the mind keep like losing the attempt, losing the concentration, you know, and and like being with the breath or or something, and the mind goes to lots of thoughts. And, um, and are they are they troublesome thoughts or? Well, it's just just things that are happening. Things are happening. Yeah. Yeah. In in life, or you know, thinking about. Not the present moment. <laughs> right. Planning have you, have things been, like that. Have you been able to capture some of those thought features or explosions or however it occurs as just that, like a like a light rain or an intense rainstorm, you know, just barreling down on the ocean or the lake, just this pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter, and not be involved in the in the individual raindrops, not be drawn into the story, into the content, but recognizing that thoughts are just mental sensations, kind of like physical sensations, or thought, or ear vibrations. I know you do that sometimes. I know, I know, not so, not so poetically in, in daily life, but um, I, I, I did start to really, you know, like realize, okay, there's just so much aversion, <laughs> and then that sort of, so that has helped with the um, feeling, like being able to kind of catch that the aversion, and then it doesn't, perfect, and I don't perfect. get so caught, and then perfect. it's more like un, unpleasantness. Um, and, and that's I, even better because you move from the reaction to a reality you know unpleasant that doesn't have that moral weight of a reaction which is karmic causing so aversion causes karma unpleasant feeling tone does not it's just a result so all the pleasant unpleasant and neutral feeling tones we have are simply results of the past hour, the past life, the past 10,000 lives, and they just come pouring out, but they they don't leave um, the mark that a karmic action does. Mm -hmm. What a reaction does, attachment, aversion, ignorance, in response to pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, they are the active, the activating forces that create our personality, our mental tones, moods, uh, and therefore um, usually are what's behind an intention when we think or speak or act. So to change how we think or speak or act, if, if, if we don't like it, if we're aware that it's, it's sometimes, it's often or sometimes negative, we, we try and do just what you said, to sort of go back to the level where it's simply unpleasant and not reactive, not the aversive reaction. That kind of care and study slows you down in your daily life when it's much more difficult, you know, because everything is bombarding our senses. But if you pick one thing to choose, to make your touchstone to get good at, such as sound, it spreads everywhere. Then, then it, once you start to de-hook from reactivity, attachment, aversion, ignorance, it affects all of our sense doors. So that seems spontaneous, and it is spontaneous, but it's also a result of your training your practice, your retreats, everything you do, and to feel appreciation and joy for that. 
That's significant, much more than we think. Every time we cut off that link between a reaction such as aversion, which has a, an effect on our body, on our moods, on our personality, and it sets up an energy field around us so that we kind of carry that aversive cloud with us. Every time we cut that off and it's just unpleasant, we're creating equanimity and peace. And we're just able to be with unpleasant, it's just unpleasant or pleasant without the attachment. It's just pleasant, sometimes really pleasant, but still without the attachment. That's the kind of work that you're doing. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, remind yourself that and have mudita for that. <laughs> yes. I think of times before I could, you know, before I knew that or had that, that skill or when I forget even now and then recollect, oh, wait a minute, this aversion is just something that's really unpleasant. Feel it. And I go to the body and I feel the unpleasantness. And then the, the hook disappears, the reactive hook that would otherwise, you know, further deepen aversion in my personality stream or in my body system, it lightens up. When we're really with unpleasant, it's a nice experience because we're seeing it clearly. What we understand, we, we, we care for. We'll feel compassion for unpleasant, not reaction. So that's excellent for all of us to hear. Anything to add, Darine, dear? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I live in the desert and there is so much space here. And when another way of um, relating to this predominant thinking, thinking, thinking that is so unpleasant. I feel like I open up awareness and there is so much space. And in this spaciousness, I can have the relationship. In this spaciousness, I say to this overwhelming thinking that you also have a space, uh, a place there is a place for you to exist. Like that's how I talk to myself, you know? And so it's a, it's a way of relating and, and all this um, is worthy of, it's, it's already here and it's, it's existence is worthy and it's okay. So it, it, that sometimes is my entry, entry way. Mm -hmm. And of course, what you just talk about with Steve, that's, oh, that's our practice too. Yeah, it sounds like an entryway into like a, a a spacious abiding, an equanimous abiding. That's right. Everything can fit into it. That's nice. It's a nice metaphor. Thank you both so much. So helpful. Thank you for your practice and your clarity. Your questions are always helpful for all of us. Anyone else who has the courage to be imperfect? Steve, it's Tim Kuhn. Hi, um, Tim. Yeah, hi. Yeah. You see uh, it, it's you can see my screen is going crazy. I, I may 
speak and darken myself again, or maybe it'll stabilize, I don't know. But um, what you've been saying, what you and Darina have been saying has been very helpful on a couple of levels. When you just, say, when you use the phrase, um, I am gonna darken myself, I guess, cause I can't get this craziness to stop. Um, I'm used to it. <laughs> I mean, if you're okay, I'm okay. I'll go ahead and <laughs> is whatever is possible. Yeah, it, it keeps us awake, you know, and we keep having to follow you. <laughs> it's like a light show. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's been happening for me, your, your, your comment, your phrase, to create space for everything. Um, I'm now 74, and... I've increasingly had my own health issues. And at times I do walk with a cane. And every time something goes wrong with my body, wrong in the sense of, oh, I don't know what, you know, I'm not walking so well, or I was hospitalized twice this past summer. And there immediately is a kind of panic to it. In other words, I need to have a fully intact, fully functioning body to practice well. I mean, I don't have hearing issues, but I can't hear. How can I possibly practice without being able to hear? I need to correct my hearing before I can practice. That's kind of the mindset. Um, I mean, I know it isn't good. I know it isn't skillful, but that's the mindset. And your phrase of is it possible to hold everything in space? I'm having walking issues. Okay, that's true and it is unpleasant and it is concerning, but can I create a space around it where this is still part of a larger whole? I'm not, I'm not really phrasing the question very well, but um, well, I mean- are. I, guess, I yeah, understand perfectly what you're saying. Well, I think maybe just to sort of wrap up the, the phraseology for me, it's like, I mean, I would say I have, you know, on some level, I'm aware that I have Buddha nature inside me. There's this infinite space inside of me. And my body, of course, is, is constantly changing and is beginning to fail. And so I, I guess maybe the question would be, how can I stay with that larger space, that larger reality without falling into all this, you know, oh my God, you're not gonna believe what happened yesterday kind of thinking that I tend to get into. Well, the Buddha handled it himself as he began to age and get injured and deal with his bad back yeah. and his bad cousin, Devadatta, who on several occasions tried to or even succeeded in hurting him, right. you know, is still had the same bodies like we do, and was and was fragile, and kept slowing down as the years went by, you know, up until he was eighty, and his system couldn't handle some whatever it was he ate. Some say mushrooms, some say some kind of meat. We don't know. But of course, he did make space for it. And in our talks, in our talk this morning about getting hearing aids, that opened up space for me again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, you talk about it. So I highly recommend going to a place and just checking out what it feels like to have hearing aids. Well, see, I, hearing is not an issue for me, but I have other body issues. Um, Other body issues. Okay. Yeah, it's not so much I can't hear, but the idea would be that somewhere inside of me there's a, a thought or an image. I need to have a fully functioning, intact body in order to practice effectively. And I'm yeah. aware that that isn't true. And I guess a lot of what I'm doing right now is just working with fear. You know, oh my God, and now this is going wrong. Yeah. And, and, you know, I understand. True, I, I, I work. I work every day with uh -huh. a very different body than I grew up with. Uh huh. Yeah. It, you know, in the last four years, I, half of my body is either uh, numb 
or pin pricks or pins and needles, you know, or I, I can't feel it. I stumble, I fall. I have a, I have a, I have a cane someplace in the back room. I got many years ago from Canada. That's a, a carbon fiber cane. And I think of it every day. I well, haven't thought about it yet. I guess my question is, what enables you to be okay with all that going on? You're saying all this has happened to your body, and yet on another level, you're you know you're fine. On another level, what well, I'm resisting. Thing? I'm resisting getting the cane, so I can just first try and deal with it very mindfully, yeah. moving very slowly. You know, so far, e even though I have fallen a few times, mm -hmm. I, I haven't my numb leg, I haven't banged it into a rock or a corner or a bedpost. I haven't injured anything. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and my body is still pretty flexible. If I fall, I get right back up. But you're saying that if, if there's a key to everything, it would to, to try to be mindful if possible at all. That would be the first. That is the key to everything. Yeah. yeah. It is the key to everything. So I, I use that injury. I use that aspect of aging as a primary meditation object. Uh huh. Because yeah. it's, it's always there. In other words, every morning when you wake up, you're going to wake up with these. Until I fall asleep. Yeah, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Pins and needles are prickliness or seizure or tightness or tension or numbness all the time, all throughout the day. Right, 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 right. And I can still swim. I can still do stand-up paddling, yeah. snorkeling, surf, body surf. I can, I can do all those things I did when I was younger. I, I just work around it, you know. My sense of gravity has shifted a bit to the right. So I compensate with my right side while still trying to exercise my left side because it's in therapy. So uh, it, it needs to move. Yeah. And Pilates helps and acupuncture helps and Tai Chi helps. So I do all those things that help. And when You're I consciously have, working all the time. with Working with, all the time. Yeah. Like, I, like we do with mindfulness. We, we work all the time with mindfulness. I had read, an, I'm not going to keep talking, but I had read an interview with a rock star who goes way, way back. And he said, it is really strange to be in competition with yourself because we put out a new record and everybody harks back to the record that we put out 30 years ago. And I mean, I feel like I'm in competition with myself in terms of images of what I used to be able to do and now can't. And clearly that's not good. <laughs> I understand <laughs> so, that. I, I remember particular waves I surfed at Waimea Bay or Sunset Beach yeah. Yeah. that were three times bigger than me or four times bigger than me yeah. Yeah. that I executed, you know, really well uh -huh. and imprinted themselves in me like a gift, like a precious gift. Something you I, can do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember exactly. I know my body remembers how it felt. I can't do that anymore. I shouldn't do it anymore. I won't do it anymore. I do the body surfing down on the West Coast here. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's good enough for me. That's big enough for me. Right. And I just recollect the youth and athletic days of my youth. Uh, you know, it was like always summer. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot more abilities. Yeah. It's no longer my youth. I no longer have those abilities. So I just, you know, I bring it into what abilities I do have and what I can do. Yeah, and you don't make it a problem, it doesn't sound like. You I know. don't make it a problem. Yeah, yeah. My Pilates teacher keeps using me as an example on her website, saying, if this 70-something old guy can do I it, can, yeah, yeah, anybody yeah. can do it. <laughs> It's great. You're serving as an inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, listen, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Stay with it. Yeah, I will. Yeah. I mean, I got no choice, basically. <laughs> we don't. <laughs>
Hi, Gail. Hi, Steve. Um, I just I just wanted to say I wasn't planning to say anything today, but this is so striking me. I um, thank you so much for what you've said so far, and I'm um, just getting over a pretty bad bout of COVID, which is was not fun, um, and I think we'll be getting over it for a while. And um, what I've found that's so interesting is, you know, when I was before this, I was working and there were so many things in my mind, people that irritated me and those stories just, you know, get huge and I'm constantly having conversations with them in my mind. So now I'm home, I'm starting to recover. Um, I happen to have a guest staying here who's a bit taking advantage, I think, of being here and not very helpful even when I was ill. So, so now I'm shifting to that. So now there's all these conversations in my head and these stories about, you know, what am I going to do about that? And I thought it's almost like I'm, it, I, it's like, I'm kind of almost addicted to those conversations in my head, you know, of, and um, so that, so the idea of, you know, um, realizing that thoughts are just thoughts and, you know, all the things that you've been saying so far was really, really helpful um, but it's kind of like, I'm going to go find those things. You know, I'm sitting here in my house with almost no one that should irritate me. And I found someone, right? So it's like, um, I'm just wondering if you have more to say about that. I've been trying to, this, I feel this is a, this feels like the thing I'm working on this year, very much. I'm about to retire soon. And I'm like, okay, I've got more time to work on this at work. Apparently I've got, I'm always going to carry it with me. So. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. It does make sense. Gail, do you feel like you have a discipline? What do you mean by discipline in terms of well, discipline comes from disciple. A disciple does what she loves to do, mm -hmm. whether it's art or flower arranging or cooking. Um you know, that could be missing. I mean, to a certain extent, I think I'm I'm soon retiring. So I'm putting a lot of energy into work and thinking about what's next. And so there's not, I do have spiritual practice, meditation. Um, That's what I wonder about. I do it. do that. I do do that. Um, you know, that is just like well, meditation, but not. Can you do positive. it now? Can you do it at home? Can I you can. tell your guest that, mm -hmm. that your, your life depends on having these periods of solitude and yeah. seclusion at such and such a time in the morning, afternoon, yeah. or evening, mm -hmm. and, and, and follow that. That's your refuge. That's your source. That's your resource. Yeah, maybe because I've been ill and not been able to keep that, it it's um, made it more well, difficult. You just have to enter the space. You don't have to do anything. You okay. can lie down and take a nap. You know, you can do any posture you want, and if you fall asleep, good. That's because you need it. But you're just taking that sacred space, mm -hmm. that seclusion, because it's helpful. Then there's no intrusion. There's no outside intrusion that acts, activates our, you know, our hindrances. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a lovely thing, and I, I'm very confident you can explain it in such a way that that discipline for you is the same as the nurture of food or the nurture of the environment. Yeah, I think um, one of the things I, I notice is that I, I bring all these thoughts in when I do that even. So that's part of the frustration of that is that even that doesn't always feel safe. No, of course not. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what thoughts do. Mm -hmm. You know, that's their resistance to feeling feelings. You know, you know, th eventually we develop more and more a relationship with thoughts and they don't hold the same grip. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're useful uh, because they kind of might help block overwhelming intrusion. So we, we go to skillful thoughts or happier thoughts or compassionate thoughts. 
Other times it's just, you know, the usual chaos of thoughts. And, and we just have to make space for it or understand it, that in some way underlying the thought process, it is a protection against feeling the feelings that you're having by the intrusion you feel by the guest in your house. Mm -hmm. so, and once you understand thoughts that way, you can, you can bow to them, you can be grateful to them, and then you can try to replace the, the scattered or difficult or unhelpful thoughts with good thoughts. You can start using Brahma Vihara phrases, for example. Mm -hmm. May I be peaceful just as I am. May I be happy and joyful with whatever is happening. May I be able to live in this world with all its intrusions and unexpected occurrences mm -hmm. happily, joyfully. So you're tuning, you're tuning, you're using thoughts to attune to the very goodness of your being, mm -hmm. which in turn then uses your senses, including speech and thoughts, in a skillful way. That's called wise reflection. So wise reflection is also thinking, but it's very good thinking. <laughs> Darine, you have anything to add? I just want to repeat it. <laughs> that thoughts are many times, as Steve said, is a protection for for the heart. And it's uh, just see if you can just drop and, and feel the heart area. Um, and probably there is a hurt. And just for a, a one second, and then do the skillful uh, means that Steve suggests, like, or even if you think again and replay the story again, no problem. But just know that they are protecting uh, uh, this vulnerable heart. It hurts, and and anger is a protection. Yeah. Yes. Often side by side with our generosity, and you're being very generous mm. by having a guest in your house. Mm -hmm. but, but side by side with that, there, there's some hesitation, some regret, some heaviness, and just allow them both to be there. Yeah. One is the trajectory of, of doubt and, and annoyance, you know, and troublesome. But the other is a very pure trajectory of kindness and generosity, which will have a, a, a really good result in the future. Hopefully as soon as your guest leaves. Yeah, <laughs> sooner than later. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, it's helpful. Yeah, you're very welcome, Gail. <laughs> So um, Jesse and Michelle are on retreat for two months and we'll be seeing you. And if we are not here, another um, yogi, Kalyana Mita uh, from our Sangha will be holding the space. And, but we'll continue with these Sunday seats until they are back. And in a way, we're supporting their retreat too by sitting together. Thank you so much. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for helping all of us, Michelle and Jesse, Darine and I. It really helps. It helps me during the week to think about the Sangha, to know you're out there and doing your best in your day-to-day -day formal and informal practice, whether you're in Kyoto or K 
Kansas or Manitoba or Chiapas, Mexico. <laughs> Take care. We'll see you on Sunday next week. <laughs>